to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. On the show today, I have Bria Hamill with me. Bria is the principal designer and CEO of Bria Hamill Interiors, the CEO of Brook & Lou, and co-creator of Hamill House & Company. She leads a talented team of women who run between 30 and 40 major projects a year. Within the company are two design teams, which handle the details and execution of all of the firm's projects. Bria's work has been featured in national publications such as traditional home, Magnolia Journal, Good Housekeeping, HGTV Magazine, My Domain, Style Me Pretty, as well as many other local shelter regional magazines. She received the Faces of Design Award in 2015 and 2018 from HGTV. She has been nominated for an International Design Award and she was selected as a 2018 Style Spotter for High Point Market Authority. In the interview today, Bria shares the ins and outs of how she runs her firm and how she learned to run a well-managed company. Before we meet Bria, a big thank you and shout out to Kravit Inc. Have you signed up for your trade account yet? That is step one, isn't it? Often designers ask, how can I get an account with Kravit? Good news, just go to Kravit.com and fill out your firm details, right? No minimum buy needed to order with Kravit. You can order one sofa, one area rug, one yard of fabric. All the Kravit goodness is available to you, the design professional, whether you are a hashtag baby designer, a hashtag rising designer, or a hashtag season designer. And if you do have an account or, or when you do, open your account, don't forget on any one order of Kravit fabric, wallpaper, or trim, you get 10% off, right? You put in the code AWDB10 at checkout, all right? Scope out your next project, specify a Kravit product, and put that 10% savings to something terrific for yourself or your business. All righty, now I'm looking forward to introducing you to Bria Hamill. Hi, Bria. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. Thanks for having me. Excited so, to be here. Yeah, Bria. Like, there's just certain firms that, you know, when you start looking at them, you just think, ooh, okay. <laughs> You're one of those firms, Bria. So I, I mean, thank you. I don't know if I consider myself that, but thank you. No, 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 no. And it's funny because, you know, I'll share our little pre-air chat uh, with everybody. I had, I didn't find anywhere how many years you were in the industry. And so I said to you, how many years have you had your firm? And you said, oh, six years. And I'm like, okay, what else have you done? I'm like, you don't create an empire like this in six years. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, goodness. I mean, of course, you know, Shay, Shay McGee did it though, right? So it's possible. Yes, she did. Yes, she she did. did that kid. Oh my goodness. She's, she's <laughs> something else, right? Everybody's chasing her, right? Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. So, but you know, you're right there uh, with her. I mean, you're right there, you know, right there doing the same thing. Almost 100,000 followers on Instagram, 16 people on your team. Uh, it's, and the design work, the portfolio is outstanding. And so I'm Thank really you. looking forward to learning about your business and how you um, have created this platform for yourself, Bria. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so let's start with this 16-person team. There okay. are um, a couple things that I want to know about it. First, I okay. want to know um, about some of these positions in here that I thought was interesting. And then I want to get into the aspects of 
leading them and managing them. But, um, you know, look, you have the typical things that we expect to see. Design team manager, lead designer, expediter, assistant designers. There's a couple of them. An interior stylist, which is a nice thing to have on your team. Director mm-hmm. of finance, accounting assistant, marketing coordinators. Then you also have the division of Brook and Lou, and you've got the um, dedicated expediter and marketing coordinator and brand manager for that brand, which we'll talk about, too, in the show today today. But here's the two that I didn't just say, and I just pricing coordinator and corporate care specialist. So I got to know what are, what is a pricing coordinator and what is a corporate care specialist? Um, well, something that when I started the company, like everybody else, I did everything. Um, I was the designer, I was the bookkeeper, I was the ordering specialist. I did all the pricing. I mean, Whatever had to be done, I did it because I was the only person working for the company. As I started to scale and grow my team, for the first year or two, we kind of stuck to that business model where everybody was doing everything. We would just kind of divide a task or a project, and um, nobody really had specific job tasks that were related to their role. Um, And once we hit about, I would say, eight or nine employees, it became it became a little bit chaotic where nobody really knew what they were doing. No one was truly accountable for something um, like specific job tasks related to um, our projects. And so I decided that it was probably time to start creating specific roles related to the major tasks that we were doing on a daily basis. So that's where the pricing coordinator came and our expediter. Um, For a while, it started with our expediter where they were doing all of the pricing. So the design team would design the projects. We would create the pricing sheets, so create worksheets um, for the product that we were going to specify for the project. And then we would hand it off to the expediter. They would do the pricing and um, create a proposal, give it back to the design team. Design team would present it with um, the presentation, the furniture, the construction presentation. And then when the client approved and put the money down, the expediter would do the ordering. Well, as we kept growing and our revenue, we were doing a lot more work. Um, we understood that it was just too much work for one person. So that's when we divided. The expediter is responsible for all of the ordering. So once we get the money, the expediter takes over. So they do all of the ordering of the product. We have trackers that we create for every client um, that we update on a bi-weekly basis. So our clients know exactly what's happening with every single piece that they've ordered from us. She does all of the um, managing the receiving with our receiving warehouse. And then she does um, all the scheduling of installations and attends most of our installations with us. So the pricing coordinator really came in. Um, and now she is responsible for pricing. Um, anytime that we have a product, we need a price for a client. We create the worksheet, and she's the one communicating back and forth with the vendors, um, getting the pricing, creating the proposals, revising proposals if there's edits that need to be made. Um, And then she also, one other thing that's really been helpful for us is with all these tariffs going on, um, she's staying on top of our vendor pricing changes. So making sure we have the most updated price lists available. Um, She's kind of keeping an eye out on, okay, we have these open proposals August 1st this vendor said that they're having a 7% price increase. So we need to go back to all of those clients and say, if you don't order by August 1st, we need to change the pricing or at least check pricing on what we priced out. So it's been really helpful for just truly keeping us organized and on top of our game. That's awesome. I love that. That's really awesome. (laughs) You know, I didn't ask you off air and what, what is your gross revenue? Where are you guys at? Yeah, so we're about three and a half million. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so that's yeah. really, you know, because, you know, you need, uh, if you're going to support this this pricing coordinator as a single, as a full-time job, a single task for a full-time yeah. uh, person, then I, that's my brain went, well, what, is it, what are the revenues of this what, firm? Yeah, there's right. a lot of pricing that's well, happening every day. Absolutely. Well, and the other thing, nice thing is that um, she's a mom, she has young kids, so she can work from home for part of the time too. Mm. So she's in the office during the summer is less than um, during the school year, but in the summer she is in the office a couple days a week and then she works from home um, when needed the rest of the days. So if it's, you know, around 4th of July, it was a quieter week. Um, so she just didn't work as much. So having her as an hour employee, hourly employee really allows us to adjust and 
um, it works great for her schedule too with having the little ones at home. Okay. Also interesting thing to note. So she's not necessarily a full-time employee. You have it. She's almost, she's a consultant pretty much. And if you need her for 10 hours or you need her for 30 hours, she just tracks her hours and bills you how many hours she works. Yes. I mean, she's definitely working closer to a full-time schedule than not on a Mm -hmm. weekly basis, Mm -hmm. but it does allow for flexibility. And she is you know, she has all the benefits and everything as all of our other employees do. Oh, so, okay. Okay. So um, you do have her yeah. on the books as your, she's not she's a not 1099. A, yep. She's not a 1099 yes, consultant. Okay. Okay. Correct. But she has flex hours and flex her. Okay. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Love it. And, and that is such a critical part of the job. And it's also of the project, I should say. And it's also, it falls out of the superpower of the design talent brain to Absolutely. yes right i mean even for me yep. with window treatments it is the most tedious thing on the planet to sit and yes. price out a project that oh makes me crazy you know what i mean it's yeah. like figure out the yardage and with the widths and the repeats and the linings and the you know the drapery hardware and put all the components together and you know you know what happens as soon as i send it over to the client or the designer they want to make three changes and i'm like great i'll do it all over again yay <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well and it's truly the lifeline of our business you know if we aren't pricing things accurately i mean our net profit goes out the window so you know it's important for our business to have somebody that is an expert at it and is truly that is what they are here to do is make sure that we are pricing things accurately for our clients i love that i mean and and for you to like you said the the tariffs and just price increases and all of that for window treatments it's not as complex because let's just be serious we don't handle as the, the complexity of products that you do you know everything from tile to lighting to carpeting to furnishings to accessories and the dozens and dozens and dozens of price lists and price increase and to know that somebody is to your words accountable for that has got to give you such peace of mind as the principal of this firm to know that that is buttoned down it absolutely does i mean for me for the long time it felt like we were trying to get a square peg in a round hole it just you know designers are creative and they don't love to do that technical detail most of them don't um so for me to allow my design team to do what they're passionate about and love to do and to find somebody she does have a design background um we're lucky in that so it was an easy transition for her but she's really good at the detail she um is very analytical so you know it's again taking the your employees strengths and Mm. utilizing them so that you're not trying to force people to do things that they're not good at no i know and there's nothing there's not there's so few feelings that are so uncomfortable as working outside of your comfort zone i mean we all have to do it to some extent in everything that we do but to spend hours every day in the outside of your comfort zone it's just unfulfilling right Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. And, and so, and it is, I can imagine very helpful that she comes from the industry because, you know, there's a shorthand with the industry there. When you say, oh, arrange yeah. for white glove delivery, you don't have to have 20 minute conversation on what that means. That means don't drop right. the crate at the front door. <laughs> right. It's, well, it's got to get opened. Of, <laughs> there's a lot of gray area in our business of, you know, understanding terminology mm-hmm. or, you know, there's, they're humans doing these, these tasks. So (laughs) the design team, you know, if they forgot to, to note on the worksheet that there is a contrast welt or, you know, a decorative tape trim on the kick plate, you know, all of that language is truly a foreign language to someone outside of the industry. So it was very helpful to have someone that's been trained in it to be able to help us with that. I love it. And then of course it does make for a more efficient expediter as well, because the expediter is not bogged down in chasing price increases and all of this stuff. The expediter is simply placing all the orders simply like that's a simple job to do. Hello. Right. But chasing, you know, placing the orders and chasing the CFAs and chasing, you know, all of that stuff. And then to your point, tracking it. And you said that your expediter is supplying every client two times a week with where their Uh, orders are, or they're supplying your design team two times a week? Every other week. Oh, 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 okay. I I, I might've said bi-weekly, but I meant bi-monthly. So they are, she is updating the trackers um, on a weekly basis, but we take our client projects and divide them in half. 
so that she can focus on half of our client projects every week. So then in that way, you know, we found that every, updating it every week was a little too much. There wasn't enough changes for the client to feel value mm. looking at this 25 page document sometimes. <laughs> um, so for us, every other week was a great time where you can truly see some change in progress in um, your item shipping. So um, how many projects do you typically carry in the pipeline at a time, Bria? Um, I would say we're at about anywhere from 30 to 40 at a time. Whoa. Okay. 30 to 40 at a time. And so what you're saying is when you say divide in half, so one week in real time, she's working on this 15 or 20. And then the next week she's working on the other 15 or 20. Exactly. That's so smart too. That's so smart too. I love that because, you know, it's the whole in and out. It's, you know, okay, you know, just get knee deep into these 15 or 20 as opposed to this one dangling item for this one client that really, you know, I get it. Yeah. I, I love it. Right. I love it. Yeah. And, and your, your point is well taken. Look, we've had, you, you told me off air that you listen to the show yeah. and that you've had yeah. for a long time. And yeah. so, you know, that we've had a lot of designers um, say that they do provide their clients with that Friday update, right? Yes. And yep. and yep. I think, you know, I think it's to your point, it depends on the size of your firm, right? And right. Uh, but whether it's every week or every other week, that update goes such a long way. Don't you think it in keeping really your does. clients happy, right? Yeah, so we we do the Friday reports too. Um, we it's interesting. We do them internally, so everyone on my team sends me a Friday report, basically recapping their week. Um, if there's any outstanding items they're waiting for answers from me on. Um, if there's any issues that they're having or things that they just want to talk about, um, they they put it in that Friday report. And so we do the same thing for our clients. So every Friday, our design team is sending their clients an email. I'm copied on all of them. And it's basically just, here's what we worked on this week. Um, Here are the outstanding questions that we have. Here's any open proposals that we haven't heard back from you guys on. Uh, And then that every other Friday would have the tracker attached to it too. Uh And it addresses a couple of different things. One of the things is when we're telling them what we're working on their project every week for, like what tasks we're completing, when we send them the design fee at the end of the month, it's harder for them to fight what our design fee is because they're getting a weekly update every week of all the things that we're doing on their projects. So, you know, sometimes when as designers, we do a lot of things in the background and I always tell our clients, it's my job to make it look easy. Um, so we're not going to be, we don't want you to necessarily be feeling the pain of all the things that we're trying to get done on their project for them. But at the same point that can hurt us because when they don't see a lot of action from us, because we're doing, we're in deep in the design or, in deep in the project management of it. And we're trying to keep them off a lot of the correspondence because that's why they hired us is to manage their project and not have it on their shoulders. Um, sometimes they get those design fees and they're like, what the heck? I haven't, I've barely seen you all week, mm-hmm. all month, you know? Mm-hmm. So for us on these Friday reports, it's nice because we can say we've been communicating with the contractor. We did a site walkthrough with your, with your plumber to make sure that everything was in the right location, you know? And it just gives them a nice clear picture of what, we've been doing. And honestly, since we started the Friday reports, we get a lot less pushback on our design fees. Nice. I love it. So I was mistaken there that there's a difference (laughs) between the report to your client and just, and, and the additional information of the tracking information to your client. So it's actually a PDF that we attach to that Friday report every other week. Nice. Okay. So it's like the long list of every rug, lamp, light. Okay. It is. Order. Every item. Ex- yeah. So it does it say order date, lead time, yep. la, 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 on target, running yep, exactly. light, back order. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. So it'll, that- and it's divided by room so they know. And then it highlights in a separate, it goes into a different column once it's received at the warehouse. So they can kind of start to see just by glancing at it, the volume of what's been received, volume of what's been shipped, and then what volume of what is still under the on order category nice. and then it'll tell them it gives a description of the product we're not putting necessarily the vendor the manufacturers or anything right. we do have a document the same document we can click on those tabs for our design team so they get that tracker um just so they have more detail on it but it it gives them the day it was ordered and then if there's any notes so like estimated ship date is july 29th those kind of things, um, or shipped on blah, 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 but it's not necessarily here yet. So 
um, it's just a nice, it just looks like we have our stuff together, you know, well, and apparently you do. Us a lot of money. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we've worked hard to get there. That's for sure. It wasn't well, always that way. Well, and that is it, isn't it? Like I always say, you know, we started window works with, you know, two dozen systems or processes and it's, you know, multiplied over the years simply to address the things that went wrong. It's like, why did, why does this keep going wrong? Okay. You need a new system for it. And so that is yeah. what happens with your business. And it's from, listen, Listening to people like you share because there's somebody out there yeah. now that's saying, oh, my goodness, like, why don't oh, right. I have this? Right. Well, exactly. I mean, I always say like these Friday reports, I didn't invent it. I probably learned it from your podcast. You know? <laughs> like, I mean, I am the queen of I will never learn too much. So I, I love listening to podcasts and I love yours that it's dedicated to interior design. Um, so, I mean, I think it's important. I I think businesses go stale the second that they think that they know how to do everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. learning and changing processes, I think that's what makes us a good firm. Definitely. And, and it's, um, it, the growth, you know, from zero to three and a half million in six years, that's, that's, yeah. that's a lot. And of course, in your background, you described how you managed, uh, you the design manager for an Ethan Allen store. And yeah. I'm sure a lot of that goes back into play. Some of the things that Absolutely. things that worked and things that didn't work. Work, right? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, I give a lot of credit to working for Ethan Allen, and I worked for about a year for Thomasville before I got out of the retail design category. But, um, you know, I think, one, I always tell people that interior designers are absolutely salespeople. Mm -hmm. And I think that designers, when they go into go to school to be a designer, they never think of that. You know, they mm -hmm. just want to make things pretty and work with fabrics. And truly, we're design or we're, we're salespeople. And I, I got that training and that mentality from working at a retail store that, I mean, that was our lifeline. If we didn't sell, we didn't get to keep our job. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I add a lot of, I give a lot of credit to those companies and then being able to move into management. I started managing the Edina Ethan Allen, um, which was the prominent Ethan Allen location in the twin cities. Um, when I was, I was 25 when I started. So wow. I was really young and I had 16 designers that worked with me. Wow. Um, and you know, what that told me and taught me was that a company like Ethan Allen believed in me. Um, they didn't, they didn't care what age I was. They knew that I was passionate about it and I, I loved the company and, um, I really wanted to do good and learn and they just, they trusted me. Um, so that's been a huge business model for me now is my um, design team manager who, you know, is kind of like my right arm has been with me since she was 19. She's 25 now and she's, you know, basically running half of my business. So wow. um, I think that, you know, having a big company like Ethan Allen believe in me and allow me to be able to do what I did for their company um, was great. And then, of course, I learned the business side of it. I learned what a PL was and I learned how to set budgets and to meet those budgets. And I learned what the pressure was like when numbers weren't great. And, mm. you know, how do you, I had to do layoffs one time, you know, like I, I did all of that with them. And so it taught me how to truly run a business, which I think is something that really lacks in the design industry training is, you know, the business side of it, which is a huge part of our business. Sure. Well, I mean, to your point, it's so interesting because you, uh, you know, when you say if we didn't sell, we didn't get to keep our job. It's the same thing, right? You know it. It's, You're, it, it but, and yeah. what you know to be true is if you don't sell, you don't get to keep your company. <laughs> Absolutely. You know what I mean? Well, so and, the stakes are even higher, them, right? Yeah. And our employees, I mean, you know, they, they need to know that too, is that, you know, I try and make this as easy as possible. And that's the, that's the benefit of working for someone instead of owning your own business is you don't have to feel as much of that pressure. But at the same time, if we make mistakes too often, and if we're not taking it seriously, or if we're not meeting our deadlines, that's all of our jobs, you know, right. so it's, it's important. And I think that it's something that I'm, I feel passionate about. And I really try to empower our team as they truly have a piece of this business. Mm. I think that's awesome. And I think I'm so, it's so nice to hear how you repeated the privilege that you were given by Ethan Allen in hiring this young woman at 19 years old and giving yeah. and grooming her all the way through to this level of responsibility at 25 to yeah. be the design team manager of a company yeah. this size is, is, is as significant as you being the design absolutely. manager at Ethan Allen. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, we have had many designers over the years 
come and, you know, as we say, cut their teeth at Ethan Allen. Sandra Funk is one of them. Yeah. There's been several. Uh -huh. um, I can't recall any else off the top of my head. But um, and we've also had designers over the years mention how I think Candy Scott mentioned how coming from retail helps because she working in furniture retail because from the standpoint of selling, right, that same thing of learning yeah. how to sell and also understanding the distribution channel for furniture and the industry okay. from the other side of it so that it f informs you when you go to open and lead your own company. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's funny because if I had a nickel for every DM and <laughs> message that I get from a young designer that says, how do I learn how to do this? And my brain yeah. is like, go work for somebody. You yeah, know, absolutely. go work for somebody. You certainly can come out of school or transfer careers and open your own company. There's no question. We've had so many sure. guests that have done it. But I think it's, for me, uh, Bree, you tell me what you think. But I think if my goal were to sit down and really say, in three, five, six, eight, ten 10 years, I want to create a three, five, ten million $10 million company, as opposed to my goal, which is as important and as valid of I want, I, there's a, I've met a lot of designers that want a small firm themselves and an assistant, that that's how they want to manage their life. That's what fits in there. Yeah. And I think both goals are supported by having work for someone else first. But when, if your, if your goal is the first one, I almost think it's like a non-negotiable that you can't just come from to your point design school and then assume you're going to know how to run the back end of the business, or it's just going to take you even longer to, to figure it out, yeah. I guess. I, I mean, I think it would be a very painful process if you do it that way, which so like, it, yes, you can do it, but that means you have to learn all of your own mistakes yes. and you have to make, you have to go through all of that pain where for me, I let somebody else pay those bills. Like, right, you right, know? Right. like I mean, it's just how it is, is that when you work for another company, they assume those costs right. and, um, you can watch other people, it, you know, I was lucky enough to work for companies that had, it wasn't just myself and um, the owner, besides one year of my life, my career, um, I always had other teammates and things to people to work with. So you could learn from their mistakes too. So, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. mean, being a sponge is a huge part of it is just being, keeping your ears open and never thinking you're too good enough, too good to learn more. And, um, you know, that was just a huge part of my career path. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's awesome. So, so tell me what is this corporate care specialist? Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, we, um, we knew for a while that we needed somebody to kind of be the heart of the business. So somebody in our office that just kept us together. Um, some people could potentially call her an office manager um, but she's just kind of keeps track of everything that's going on internally with our, with our office and our studio space. Um, so she answers the phones for us. She manages, um, the conference room schedule, makes sure that we have all the goodies and things that we need whenever we have a client or a vendor coming in. Um, she also does our lead calls. So when anybody calls in to the office, um, she t takes that call we have a form. We use Salesforce to track all of our leads. Um, so she enters all of the information into Salesforce, which then generates an email to my design team manager um, to, to review it and then potentially schedule a intro call. Um, and then she helps us with managing our IT person um, when we need to have the IT company come in and help us because none of us are IT IT people. <laughs> um, oh, you could have called she, me. I'm awesome with technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, and then she, I mean, just anything and everything that we need, she's kind of the go-to person. Um, she, if people are sick and the, any of the employees are sick or they're running late, they let her know. She spreads it to the team. So it's, she's just kind of like the center of all of us because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of people here. So to have one person that's kind of the go-to um, person to communicate or um, just to help manage what's going on in the office. She's like the mom. 
personality. She really is. She's she a is mom. a mom and now a grandmother. So she has that personality too. So it's perfect for us. <laughs> okay. Okay. So she, when we say corporate care specialist, we mean Bria Hamill's corporation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So and I was looking at it the other way. I was like, do you have a commercial division? Oh, like, sure. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, no, she she handles all of our corporate, you know, not just client facing, not just internal. She does both. Right, right. Very good. That's a, it is it is an important position to have. You need somebody that is the hub at Window Works. It's we call it the showroom coordinator, and it is mm-hmm. that yep. central person. That you know, did you tell Adriana? That's all I want to know. Does Adriana know this? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, like that's what I say all the time. It's like somebody's like, oh, oh I see. yeah, yeah. yeah. See They're saying to me, oh, you know, I have to this <laughs> and now. I'm like, okay, does Adriana know? That's all I need to know. Right. Yeah, exactly. You need to have one person that just knows everything yes, basically yes 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 that's yes, what she is that's it and then of course poor adriana sometimes i'll be like adriana how did this happen i don't know i didn't know about it how do you not know about anything here how does that happen right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, big job. yeah yes it definitely is okay so um a little bit more about the way the team is run so um, give me some structure. So you have the design team manager, you had the lead designer, you have two assistant designers. So how are, is your hand Bria on 40 projects or, or and do you have, do you have like, I, I call it like, do you have two different verticals going where you've got one yeah. designer that is handling an entire project, you know, and she's got all of her support and you are probably overlooking, maybe you've made the, you know, the initial close with the person. How do you, how do you do that? Sure. So um, maybe I should start with kind of our phases, uh, our process for design projects, because then that'll help explain where everybody fits in. So we have four phases of our design process. Um, Our first phase is our onboarding phase. That is um, when we get the, basically from the start, when we get the signed LOA um, until we start the design process. So that means um, that we send a client a client questionnaire with personal questions just so that we can get a better better understanding for them, their family, how they want to live in the space, what type of project have they worked with designers before, tell us the goods, the bads, why aren't you working with them anymore? So a lot of the questions that come from our intro calls too, mm. but it's nice to have them write it down because it holds our clients a little more accountable for mm-hmm. those answers. Um, and then we also assign them homework. So they have to do they have to send us inspiration pictures and, you know, depending on the client's age and where they find inspiration, it could be Pinterest where they create a private board or not private necessarily. Um, house account could be tear outs from magazines. A lot more people are using, um, Instagram and saving images. So they will screenshot and put it into a Dropbox folder for us. It doesn't really matter how we receive it, but we, need our clients to show us inspiration pictures of rooms that just feel good to them. It doesn't have to be specific. Like we want our kitchen to look like this, or we want our living room to feel like this, but it's just more of like, what is the environment? It's amazing as designers, how we can pick up on um, really a trends in clients, what they're attracted to without Mm. them really knowing it. Right. We asked clients, we asked a client one time, um, if they liked high contrast and she said, no, I definitely don't like high contrast. I like everything to be kind of monochromatic and neutral. And, um, once we looked through her inspiration pictures, there was a ton of high contrast. Um, it was more so shown in the architectural details than necessarily in the fabric. So when she was saying that to us, she was saying, I don't like high contrast in, in my furnishings. But when we looked at her, white walls with black windows everywhere and uh contrasting dark island versus white kitchen Mm. cabinets you know those kind of things we're like well you do like contrast (laughs) it just wasn't the context you were thinking of right well that's the part where language is so important right because you're saying one thing and they're hearing another and you need to be clear so the images are perfect for that Yes, exactly. And sometimes clients just don't know the verbiage or they don't really know. They just can say, well, I know that I like how that looks. Right. So um, that that's all part of our onboarding phase. We take that our first kickoff meeting with the clients. We, we review 
our processes um, and we review their inspiration pictures is a big part of it. Um, and kind of going through, they talk us through the images. It could be five, it could be 25, you never know. Depends on the client, but um, we have them kind of talk to us on each image and just tell us like, what do, what do you love about this picture? Is there anything you don't love about this picture? Um, so that we really start to create a vision in our heads in that very first meeting of what we think that the space is gonna feel like and look like. Um, and then after our um, kickoff meeting, we move into our vision building which is still part of the onboarding phase, but the vision building is when we take those inspiration images and we might pull 20 more pictures and we kind of divide the project by room. So if it's a whole house, like a new construction and decorating, um, we'll do the main key room. So like a kitchen design board, we'll do a living room, a master bathroom, just the main rooms that are, have a lot of detail to go into them. And we create vision boards. So just inspiration pictures of things that we think that they'll be drawn to. It could be a few architectural details that we think um, will really elevate the project and things that we are like, oh, we would love for them to do that. So let's show them. Um, it could be a crown molding detail or a type of kitchen hood that um, we think would be really cool and kind of address their style and aesthetic. Um, and then we do one more meeting with them in the onboarding phase, and that's the vi the vision presentation. So we present these beautiful design boards that are all just basically visual, finished, completed projects. Could be a lot of ours, could be other ones that we've found that we've saved. Um, and just basically those rooms are then defined. So everybody is on the same page of what the look and the feel of each space is going to be. Um, and what's nice about that is that then our design, our design team truly can all stick together because this is where our teams, you know, having more multiple people working on one project can be overwhelming or confusing to clients and internally. So I am the visionary. I work on all of projects on a high level. So I'm really involved in the onboarding phase and I'm really involved in the design phase of the project. Once the client sees the project um, and gave, basically gives their stamp of approval, I back out. Um, and I peek back in a little bit, checking in on the project, you know, during the project management phase and then at the installation. But we have a lead designer that is um, in every phase, very heavy, heavily involved in every phase. So um, my design team manager is also a lead designer. So we have two design teams and they have a lead designer and a design assistant that works on, and they always work together. So they have their systems down. They do things a little differently. You know, we have our processes, but they, they have different personalities and different things that work well for them. So they've kind of internally created those processes. Um, but what's nice then is that, you know, it, it keeps a structured team and everyone's really on the same page and you're not having a lot of crossover between design assistants. Okay. So what's happening is once you have had your intake, you've signed your LOA, you've had all these fun, feel-good meetings at the beginning, and you, as the principal, are able to look both at your client and your team and say, we have a clear vision of where to take this now. We know exactly yeah. what we're going to do for this client. Then you pass that to one of two of these teams. And then, Correct. so like Client Smith, you're going through this whole thing and one lead designer might get Client Smith and then the next day you might be, have been doing weeks of presentation, you know, preparing for and have a presentation for Client Jones and the other designer is going to take that one. And they each have assistant that works under them and now they go about as if they were a, a solo firm with an assistant running a project. Except, of course, they have yeah. the benefit of the corporate care specialist and the expediter right. and the pricing. <laughs> you know, yes. they get all the those perks. The only difference is that they are involved in the vision building. So they will, oh, okay. we assign them to the project. Um, once As we it, get that LOA, yes. we assign the design team. Okay, that makes sense. Of course, they should be in, yeah. in, in part of that. Okay. And so yep. when you think about when you have done your initial intake calls and you've done your initial, you know, you whatever you're doing that gets you to the sign yeah. LOA. Yep. Are you the one, Bree, that's deciding, oh, this is going to be so much better with this design team? Or is it simply just which one has the bandwidth to handle it? Um, it's It's all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, of course, bandwidth matters, but I will cheat on that a little bit if I think that personality-wise or aesthetic-wise, um, there is just a really good fit with right. one of the teams, not the other. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, it, but most of the time it works out that 
it just works out it where works we have out. each yeah the the there are most most of the time both teams are kind of running at the same pace so mm-hmm. Um, it's more so of what feels like a good fit for the client. Okay. Okay. I love it. And then what happens is these, these ladies and their teams, they get going on getting all of the work done. You're, you're around, obviously we're going to, I'm going to ask you again about your Friday reports, but you're moving on to finding the next client and putting the next project in the pipeline and closing that down and being spectacular and fabulous to convince them to work with you. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is definitely my job is kind of onboarding the clients and getting them um, to hire us. Mm -hmm. And then I, I oversee the design. So they pull the design um, after we've approved the vision boards, then they go and work on pulling the designs together. Sometimes they'll lean on me if they're like, Oh, we're struggling to pull this room together. You know, can you help us a little bit? Um, Or I might have a couple of pieces that I'm like, we have to use that piece we saw on market last year, Mm. you know, things like that. So it's collaborative, but they do, they do the heavy lifting. So Mm -hmm. they're pulling all of the finishes and selections. Then we have an internal meeting where I review with them. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's always, it's nice to have a second set of eyes looking at scale or I have, you know, most of the time, I think everybody here, I have more design experience. Um, as far as years go. So there might be things where I'm like, oh, I used that a couple of years ago and it was not, it didn't, not a great quality or mm. it actually looks like this in person. It doesn't look mm. like it does in the picture. You know, all of those kind of things. So I reviewed the process, but then they're the ones I'll sometimes sit in the design presentations, but they're presenting. So they can take ownership of the project. Then. Oh, okay. So as they go through the process and they're presenting each of the actual individual items that they're suggesting yes. for the spaces, you let them run, run lead on that and yes. you're there. That's, yes. that's good. That's nice. That's awesome. Well, well they're the ones that have all the it. questions and it creates right. the relationship, right? Yeah, exactly. It creates buy-in because if I'm just the, the, the leader of every meeting, then all of a sudden I back out after the design is approved, you know, the clients will kind of be like, where, are, like, where'd you go? Mm-hmm. You know? Like, so it allows the, it allows our team to have the trust gained from the client. Right. In beginning. other words, the client is seeing you transfer, transfer your trust to your team. So therefore the client is more apt to do the same. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I love it. It's awesome. Now, tell me about these <clears throat> Friday reports that you get from your team each week. Yep. Are they, yeah. Bria, are they a formal thing that you have dis- devised almost as if I would say like fill in a questionnaire document or just anybody, just they all have to shoot you an email and tell you their life story for the week. Where are we at? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's definitely not, it is definitely not formal and everyone does it a little different. So I have some employees that um, keep it short and sweet. And, you know, a lot of the times the, the reason why we started them is because I travel a lot. We have a lot of out of state projects and I'm definitely have more heavily involved on those projects. So I'm, I mean, I tend to travel almost every single week. Um, so, so for me to be able to have a touch point with them is really nice. So they use it as the format is typically just in the body of an email. Some of them go client by client, um, and give me updates when we started doing the Friday reports to clients that I'm CC'd on, they didn't have to do that as much for me anymore because I could read those and see mm. kind of what was going on with the project. So it's more so just internal stuff like, um, hey, you know, don't forget I sent over so-and-so's design boards and I need you to approve them. Our presentation's on Wednesday, just a reminder. Or, or hey, this install that we had scheduled, it ended up the clients can't have us come that time, so now – does this work for your schedule? You know, just different things like that. And then it could be like, just a heads up. Um, I just got invited to go on this amazing vacation and it's in three weeks. Is there any way I can go? (laughs) 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 So, I mean, it could be anything like that. It could be that, you know, they had a rough week and they're like, Oh, I'm feeling really badly about how this went. And, um, I don't want you to be upset with me about it or just, basically anything to do with how they're feeling things are going internally. Um, when they don't have a lot of face time with me, it can be hard. And sometimes they can think like, Oh, she must be mad that I made that pricing mistake or I ordered the wrong piece or whatever. So it's, it gives me a chance to right respond to them and say like, I get it. Let's use this as a learning lesson. Mm. Um, you know, like everyone makes mistakes, but again, like 
let's learn from it and what learn what we can do differently next time. Or I can say like, absolutely go on that vacation. Or I could say, Hey, you've been gone a lot this year. Like <laughs> make sure you're like, you're about to run out of vacation days. You know, it right. could be any of that kind of stuff, but right. we keep it light. It's not meant to be like a sob story. Rarely are they sending me anything negative. It's truly more just like, I haven't seen you this week. Here's what's going on. If you don't mind, like this is high priority on my list. It's in Asana assigned to you. You haven't done it yet. Can you please make sure to do that over the weekend? That kind of a thing. Okay. Okay. And that was my next question is, are you using any of the tools and the apps in order to, you know, communicate with everybody like Asana? Yeah. And so, so you use Asana. Now, Brie, are you the one who is primarily responsible for assigning tasks in Asana or does that come from no. your design team manager? Yeah, I and I probably the corporate tasks. care specialist, right? These yep, two I people. get a, I get a lot of tasks assigned to me. But I don't <laughs> assign a lot of tasks anymore. That's really I mean they and they're really good about assigning themselves tasks. Okay. So when you have multiple people working on one project, sometimes it's a matter of they're sitting down on a weekly basis and reviewing the project and saying all of these things need to happen. Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? Um, and then it's a nice checkpoint for us too when I'm on the road and you know I might be in Florida working on a project that I get an email from a client. I can just go into Asana and I don't have to bother them. I don't have to send them an email yes. or a Slack asking what's going on. I can just look in Asana and be like, okay, I see that they're doing this, but they're waiting on so-and-so to get the sample mailed to us before we can move forward. You know, So right. Asana is definitely like, it's, it's an amazing tool and I don't know what we did before we used it. Mm, I know we use it here. Uh, my friend Sandra Funk turned us on to it and uh -huh. it, it is, it's a terrific thing. It's like organized and all in one spot. Yeah. So you mentioned yeah. um, Slack. How do you use Slack with your team, Brie? So Slack, we decided to introduce to the team when we had too many people where it was getting really loud in the studio. Where It's an open office. We only have two private offices, mine and our um, director of finances office. So everybody else sits out in the open, and it was just getting loud. Um, so Slack was great for that part of it. The people could just send general messages back and forth asking, like, who's ordering lunch today? Anybody want to go in on this? But then now it's divided and we use it much more in an organized way as far as different projects we're working on, um, different types. With Brook and Lou, it's been a huge thing for us because a lot of the business actually happens at night. You know, a lot of people shop at night. So mm. there's questions. Um, I can send a Slack and say, hey, I just saw this order go through. Why is this like that? You know, um, or do we still have that in inventory or is that going to be back ordered? Or, you know, so we have all these different channels in Slack that can categorize it um, so that the right people are seeing it. So not everybody in the company has to see it, but it is so much faster than sending an email. And I mean, we all know just emails, it, I mean, talk about adding stress in your life. It's I know. just seeing all of the emails. It just instantly makes you feel like you have to work 24 hours a day. Right. So having those little quick slacks, it's just a, it's kind of like text messaging, you know, but in a much, much more organized way. And you can send reminders for yourself. You can forward Slack to your email inbox so that if you do need to address it or make it more of a project, you can also send it to Asana and create a task. So, I mean, it truly is just another, um, another major tool of our business. And do I understand it to be the difference in it is Asana is for a specific project and for everybody that's in the Asana to be able to see if a task has been done, whether it's a colleague yeah. to colleague or you as the principal, right? Or them yep, to looking absolutely. you. Whereas Slack is more for the question. It's, I need, yeah. I need this question answered and I don't need to make yeah. it a task. I don't need to make it a big deal. Just right. answer me. Darn it. Yeah, it's a lot of questions. Exactly, just like one line questions. Right, but but the channels there, so you can have. Do you have it? The channel set up as by project and by office information and you know la 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 so if you have like if you are on a plane and you see that you have a question that you just left from your florida project and you have a question do you go into a channel that is marked you know florida project and you ask the question there we don't use um slack for projects like divided by projects it's more so on managing the business so like we have an accounting channel we have a 
marketing channel. Um, we have Brook and Lou marketing, Brook and Lou product, Brook and Lou website, um, calendar questions. We have a design team one. We have a leadership team one. You know, so it's kind of more of like categories in the business. Oh. Um, we're hosting a wedding shower for two of our employees that are getting married in September. So it's a locked channel so they can't see it. Everybody else is on it except them. Um, so we have a wedding right now. I see that I have wedding shower, a bunch of messages in there. So it's just, you know, imagine the string planning a wedding shower with, we have actually 19 people that are in our office at all times. So having a wedding shower channel has been great because otherwise I'd probably have 450 emails about planning this wedding shower. Right, 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 you know, right. So it's really more internal. Yes, we could have, and I'm not saying we won't someday switch to having ones for each project, but right now it, we use Asana really well that it seems to be working to do it in Asana. But, okay. Okay. Uh, so, Understood. Yeah. And then email, yeah. do you use G Suite to connect with your team at this level? Do you just use regular? What do you use for email? We're, we use Outlook. Okay. Um, simple. We all have Macs here. It works really well on our phones. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been using Outlook since day one. Okay. It still seems to work for us. Okay. I mean, these are, you know, these are, uh, these are important questions when you Absolutely. learn to scale your business because it's Definitely. the details that if you don't lock them down, you cannot scale you because you, you, Absolutely. you take the project on, right, Bria, but then you don't manage it well and therefore you right. don't get a lot more of them. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, organization is key and keeping employee retention too, you know, trying to keep it organized here for them. So that we're not creating a high stress environment. Right. Um, all of these tools have been so important for us. Right, 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 right. And it is, and then, and that's another good point of it is because the, we've, I, look, I don't know if you have any experience with it, but at different growth periods in our yeah. business, whether it's window works or the podcast, there's always been moments in times where I'm looking at the people that work for me and go, yeah. I know this is chaotic right now. Like I, 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 I feel it yeah. too. I feel it yeah. too. I'm with you. Yep. And you know, this is what I'm trying to do to put in place. I'm going to hire this person. We're going to take, pick up this system. And this is how, you know, we came to start to use Asana and now we're going to start to use G Suite and you know, it's just right. different things and and Adriana's position who I mentioned for the first time in 37 years is going to be it's like you splitting up your expediter to a pricing coordinator and expediter okay. we are now splitting her position and going to hire a second person to quote unquote do a job that's been done by one person for all yeah. these years except that you know we're at the 3.5 million mark too and it's it's more than mm -hmm. one person can't can't do it <laughs> you right can't. yeah absolutely so well, and I mean yeah. that's Scaling, I'm, I wish that there was somebody maybe, I don't know that I'd ever listened to one of yours, but a couple of years ago when I was scaling, um, just having somebody to kind of tell you like the things that happen when you scale, yes. like you need to be prepared that you're going to have changeover because the people that signed up with you when you were a three or a four person team, your processes were very different mm. and the, the environment was very different. And it doesn't mean that you're, you're a bad employee or a business owner, but it's just a different environment. So, mm -hmm. you know, having people that are okay with adding things like Asana and Slack, you know, you might have people that aren't really techie and don't love those kind of things. And they just want to be able to come and talk to you in person. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't always do that when you have 20 people in the office. So, right. um, you know, I think that part of that is just, I, th I just think that Scaling is a big, it's a whole nother, that could be a whole nother podcast. That's yeah, for sure. that's the truth. No, it's the truth. And that's why I'm spending so much time on it. Because to your point, we've had some conversation, but not many. And um, right. it's, you know, there are a lot of designers out there that are at that three, five, seven, eight level employee. And you, you want to address some of these systems and lock them down before you grow. I mean, a lot of it you can't do until you're actually knee deep in the weeds and you fall down and you scrape your knees, but you know, you can get this stuff up and running and get used to it and therefore make it easier for you to onboard. And to your other point, Bria, yeah, you're right. Um, just like there are designers out there that have absolutely no desire to build a team beyond themselves and maybe a bookkeeper and um, a, de a design assistant. There are designers as employees, employees, not employers, mm -hmm. employees that also have no desire to 
be part of a 20 person firm. They want right. to be that one important person to that one yeah. important principal. And you know, that's everybody's cup of tea, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. But to your point is the, 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 the message is when you do either own a firm of this size or you're part of it, you've got to expect the systems and the accountability that's built in because for you, mm-hmm. as you said, to keep your uh, eyeballs on so many different, move, different moving parts, there has to be, I mean, otherwise, what are we going to do? Like at two o'clock in the morning, check in with everybody? Like that's insanity, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I try not to do that. Exactly. <laughs> Thank God for Slack that it snoozes when they go to bed. So I can send them messages if I wake up in the middle of the night. And they oh, see, see I didn't, you know, we just uh, <laughs> signed up for Slack this week and we haven't started using it with the podcast yet, but I didn't know that. And that is a good thing. That's a good thing because I, you know, I have one of my team members is a remote team member and she's in uh, California. And I have to tell you half the time I'm at, you know, eight o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking, Luann, what do you, yeah. you and I'm like, I, you know, and I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, you gotta just close your email to me because I can't not wait till 12 right. o'clock to start working. Well, you'll, lose, you'll lose that train of thought. So yes, Slack yes. is great for that. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So we're looking forward to implementing that. So, okay. Now, Bria, you have added a whole nother layer to your already big interior design business. You've added this retail component with Brooke and Lou. Tell yeah. us about this. What is the deal? This is... You know, I, I, this, I look, I know it's related to interiors. I know that you're selling yeah. interior product, but this is a whole nother business. I mean, you could have opened it, up absolutely. a car shop. I mean, you know, like, let me yeah. have a car dealership right here inside of my interior design firm. Right. It's a and complete, that way for yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, I know it to be true. I don't know what somebody said to me the other day. Oh, you should open that. I'm like, really? Like that's a whole nother business like that. Don't yeah, tell me just it because it connects to fabric. It's the same thing. It's not, you know? Right. <laughs> so, so tell us the reason for doing it, Bria, and some of the ins and outs of doing it. And, and sure. what do you, are you finding success with it? Sure. Yeah. So, um, we, the kind of the background is, um, the clients that we tend to attract for Bria Hamill interiors are, Typically, younger families, most of them have young children. Um, they either that or they're entertainers. Um, they love to truly live in their house. We don't have a super formal aesthetic. We're not a super formal design team. Um, so our clients just want it. They always are coming to us saying, we want a beautiful home that truly is a reflection of us but we want to be able to use every space, every piece of furniture. We don't want to have to worry about it. So since I began, and it's it's the part of my life that I'm in too. I have um, a three-year-old and now a seven-year-old. Um, we have always designed homes with furnishings that could stand up to lifestyles of families that really truly lived in their spaces. Um, that always took a lot of work on our part of, trying to create these products, source things that would stand up, that wouldn't scratch, or you could spill on and not have to worry about ruining it. Um, We were doing a lot of extra treatment um, to protect that furniture. And we just started to realize that this is really a missing niche in the industry. Um, Yes, there are places that can do it. Um, There are places that you can custom make things to make it a certain way, um, cleanable and usable and um, what we have now trademarked as life friendly. Um, But it was a long process and we'd always, there was certainly not a lot of access to it on the retail level, on the consumer level. So um, with that in mind, and then as we started to grow grow our social following and we kept having all of the direct messages and the questions on our Instagram posts about where all of our sources are, we started to think to ourselves, you know, we have this niche of product and that we definitely have a clientele that we attract for our aesthetic, but also for the type of furnishings that we're specifying. And then we have all these people that might not be able to afford to hire us as designers, but they still want our, our look. They still want to, you know, be able to kind of capture the vibe that we, we put into our projects. So it was kind of a no brainer for me when I finally decided to do it, um, that to start an e-commerce company that, these clients, customers um, could purchase from us on their own without having to necessarily hire a designer. 
Um, and they would have access to this now life-friendly furnishings that we um, have curated or in many cases manufactured ourselves. So we have, um, I would say we're about 35 to 40% is what we token as life-friendly. And um, 99% of our life-friendly product is exclusive to us. Um, so our wallpaper is life-friendly. It's all commercial grade, completely wa wipeable. Um, our, we sell fabric by the yard that is stain resistant and we're getting ready to launch um, wipeable fabric that is what I call stain, stain proof. I have yet to have my kids ruin it. Um, <laughs> and we'll see. I mean, there's never anything that's 100% right. life proof, but that's why we call it life friendly. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, but, you know, we've really tested all of these products. And so about... 40% of the product is exclusive to us, which is was important to me because I didn't want to go out and just start another company. I know who our competitors are. There are some designers out there that are doing big business and big things, and I wasn't interested in just starting something else just to replicate what they were doing. So really our mission is to someday be 100% life-friendly um, and 100% exclusive. But for now, you know, and it, to be smart about scaling, I had to do – it in a way that was financially safe and um, we could start off by being profitable. So um, we started Brook and Lou last August, so we're coming up on our one-year anniversary and it's been going great. I We've been so lucky to have the traction that we have gotten in 11 short months. Um, we have been in national publications, I would say at least one national magazine for the last six months. Wow. Um, so it's just getting really well received by a lot of people. Um, and then another surprising aspect is we, a big portion of our business is actually from the trade. So we have a trade program, um, that is very, um, is very competitive with all other retail companies out there. Um, the nice thing is we know what they all are cause we're part of their programs. So, um, we've made sure to be competitive with those programs. Um, and it's been huge because again, we have exclusive products. So if they want our patterns, wallpapers, and fabrics, and our upholstery, um, and some of our case goods, they have to order it through us. Um, so it, we're, we've been so grateful that the trade has been out, out there and supporting us so much. And I do have a lot of friends in the industry. Um, one of my friends, Vicki Sereni, did the Southern Living um, Idea House in May, and she did a whole bedroom in our Brook and Lou wallpaper and mm -hmm. had pillows and some of our wrapping paper in there from last holiday. So, you know, I mean, thank God for our friends in the business um, who have been such a huge support to us. That's awesome. But, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let me get into some of the nitty gritty of this. Okay. Sure. Um, first of all, the practical question, are your children Brook and Lou? Yes, they are. My daughter's Brooklyn. My son's Louie. <laughs> okay. I was like, it's either that or they're your dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, those are my kids. <laughs> okay. So that's, the, you know, I had to, I had to ask the burning question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, now, the, the, the other questions that I have is, you know, look, Bria, it's one thing to start an e-commerce site. I mean, that's an animal and a bear unto itself. But then yeah. you have this layer of that 40% of the product is exclusive to you. So yeah. how, you know, like I've interviewed enough people that have created fabric lines and licensed them with Kravit. Um, yeah. It's not easy. It's a multi-year process. So how, you, that seems like two another whole business in there. How are you doing that? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, thank God for my team. Um, I have amaz an amazing team that's very efficient, very creative, um, and smart to be able to help. I mean, we tr we started this. We started the idea of Brook and Lou probably less than twelve months before we actually launched. So it was a very quick turnaround. Um, we always joke in Minneapolis, we're really lucky. There are amazing artisans and manufacturers here that can um, produce things for us locally. So all of our fabric and wallpaper is printed locally. And our artist is local, so she um, comes to our office, meets us with us once a quarter. We show her inspiration for kind of what patterns we're wanting to introduce. She um, paints them for us. I approve them or we tweak them and then she uploads them and then we send that file to our 
our printers and they print samples for us. Then we approve colorways and then, you know, we narrow it down and we launch, you know, every or every quarter we're probably launching three or four different patterns. It's amazing. I mean, because I yeah. think a lot of us think, okay, I've got to start to find, you know, factories overseas that I can, you know, la, 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 like, how am I going to work all this out? And you're doing it right there in Minnesota. We are. Yeah. yeah. I don't think, I, I don't think I could do this if we we're trying to do the overseas thing. And I'm not against it. We actually, um, one of our clients lives in India and we had the opportunity to help her with her home. And then we flew over there to see her, um, in Bangalore about it was about a year and a half ago and while we were there um, she introduced us to a block printer and so that that block printing company does make one of our patterns um, in our line and so she she block prints it and then she mails the yardage to us wow. um, from India so you know I am not opposed to having things made overseas when right. it has a story like that right um, you know there, there's so many connections with her she she has this whole another branch of her business that she's bringing to America actually where she's helping support autistic children um, by teaching them the skills of block printing because the habitual pattern, the re repetitive mm. work that goes into block printing is actually really um, soothing and compelling for autistic ch children. And my brother is autistic. So, I mean, there's just all these things wow. in these stories. So, I mean, I am all about international support when it's just, it's a feel good move. And it's well, it feels like a, a global community people. thing then. You yes, like exactly. it feels like, you know, yes, I hear what you're saying. The, uh, the layer of it that makes, that makes it important and valuable to you. So, yeah, so, exactly. so we, you know, you, you have, you said, you know, other products though, it's not just fabric and wallpaper. Mm -hmm. um, these products are also designed exclusively by you and made and manufactured only for you or you are sourcing them at high point or whatever and saying just like this like just like in the old days where the not even it still happens I don't mean to say that but you know it the only way we could do it is that the buyer from say Ethan Allen would go to high point uh -huh. and select their things you know what I mean so is it is it that same sort of thing you're finding the little resources and the valuable um, products and lines at, at the different markets and then you're putting it up on your platform to sell or it's all exclusively yeah. local how are you doing it no I mean it's definitely not a hundred percent exclusive. Um, there's a lot of pieces that we've been able to test over time that we've, we've used in our design projects and our clients love them. So we definitely incorporate some of that onto our website. Um, and then we have like our upholstery line. We went to a manufacturer and we picked out fabrics and then we design, we changed, they have like their inline frames. We changed things so that, um, it was exclusive to us the way that we're designing the frames and they were willing to work with us on that. Um, and then we also have the manufacturers where we ship our exclusive fabrics to them and they apply it to the frames. Okay. Um, so the only way to get that piece of furniture with our fabric on it is to order it through us. Okay. And, and to your other point, like this is a lot of work on the team to, you know, go yeah. and find this resource and have this conversation and then decide what details you're going to change to make it exclusive to you and then go have the communication with the fabric mill and say, yes, okay, the mm -hmm. fabric company, you will ship it to here and they will make it out of my fabric. I mean, this isn't a minute and a half. This is it is not <laughs> it's a, it lot is not. a lot you know, of work. And, and the thing is, what I know to be true is it's not just the physical work of it, the physical time on the telephone and then the physical time in the face to face meetings. Then it's the nailing down of all the pricing structure. At what price yeah. can they make the fabric or the wallpaper for you? And at what price can you sell it? And can you make some money by the time you ship it and you put it on right. a website? Yeah. And blah, blah, blah. You know, it's it is a whole nother diff, diff business, right? It is, I mean, it's truly, they're separate LLCs. Like, yeah. I could completely sell off one or have somebody else take over one and keep the other, mm -hmm. you know? Like, and I wanted, I, that was intentional when I did it because I just thought that they deserve to be separate businesses. And, um, but they will always be sister companies where they side by side. Our design team is always going to influence what the aesthetics of um, the product is that is going on Brook and Lowe so that people really see an overarching brand between the both businesses. Mm -hmm. And I have one last question about this um, sure. uh, part of the conversation. You know, I know to be true how 
firms like yourself, Laura Umansky, Lori Peranjape, you know, Sandra mm-hmm. Funk, all of you guys, Park and Oak, all of you guys, great, great, great designers, um, that you get a, like a billion DMs. Oh, where'd you get that? Yeah. And where's that lamb mm-hmm. come from? And blah, 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 right? And so right. when you, and it makes perfect sense that you are absolutely well aware that there is a demographic of, of homeowners who want their home to look a certain way, but they are not ever going to be the candidate for full luxury service interior. It's just not going to happen. And so, but that doesn't mean they don't want their master bedroom to just be the most pretty little place they ever made it, could make it to be. So my question is, when you are, do you have to give any thought to, well, I don't have the exact things available that I've placed in my custom luxury design Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, uh, project, but it's sort yeah. of a lookalike. See, now I before you answer, because I don't know what your answer is, but before you answer, <laughs> I know that I see I'm a logical person, and I know even if I was your client and I looked at across at my living room and I saw a particular item there, and I know I might have pet you know paid eight hundred dollars for it plus your hourly to decide on it and pick mm-hmm. it and put it there, I, even if somebody I'm watching on Instagram or on Brook and Lou can buy mm-hmm. it for the same $800. I know that I wouldn't have thought to put that piece there, that I know I yeah. needed to pay you to decide on that. But do you have to think in mind of what you make available to quote unquote the DIY consumer so that uh-huh. your luxury consumer isn't like, you're kidding me, Bria. Right. hundred <laughs> percent. Oh, you do. 100%. You do have I mean- to worry about it. And how do you address it? Oh, well, I definitely, I definitely do worry about that. And we do. um, So the DMs, I mean, first it starts with, I worry when on our Instagram for Bria Hamill Interiors, when we post our portfolio work, a client's project, and we get all of these questions bombarding us, where'd you get this? I mean, it's unbelievable. I love it. Of course, we take it as a compliment because it tells us that we did a good job. Mm. But when someone sends us direct message of literally, I need the paint color for every room in this project <laughs> you just posted, yeah. you know, like. I, you one, mean the ones that my client paid me hundreds of dollars to pick for them? That well, one? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and we have to be respectful of our clients' money and their investment with us. So, mm. you know, we tread lightly with that. We give some, and our clients know that we share some information. We do what we call a Friday Five on our Instagram for Bria Hamill Interiors, um, where we'll take five of the top questions that we've been asked throughout the week and share the sources um, on our Instagram stories. Most of it, has to be the retail sources or if we can find the product somewhere on a retail site. Um, But it it at least allows us to not say, sorry, we don't share that information to these followers. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, it gives them a little bit of, and I mean, people will push hard. Like I see that I asked you and you didn't include it in the Friday five. Can you include it in this Friday five? You know, so we get some of that, which is fine. I mean, that's great, but we're definitely not ever sharing like an entire home worth of sources unless for some reason there was a collaboration with a brand or like the client knew about it ahead of time right but then we have to consider our bhi clients are not gonna we don't furnish their homes with 100 percent brook and lou i never want to it's not it's a different business so yes there are some things we have some clients that want almost all brook and lou because they love the product but we are our our clients that are hiring us for our interior design services want an elevated, um, an elevated design and look that might incorporate some of those pieces, but they're getting much more custom pieces. Okay. You know, we had to, we had to keep the product on Brook and Lou accessible and it's not the least expensive. Like we're not going to com- compete with Wayfair and Amazon and some of those companies. That's not what Brook and Lou is about. Um, but it had to be enough of a price point that would make it manageable that people are willing to purchase a piece without actually touching it or feeling it mm-hmm. seating in person. So, you know, it's kind of, I would call mid-level, whereas our, our BHI clients are getting that mid to high level mixed in together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, there rarely, if ever will be a time where 
a BHI client would go and say like, oh, I can just shop my living room off of this website. You know, that's just not how we do it. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's clarity for me. I always, you know, I, it just, you know, there's, there's all these nuances and to your point yes. of the whole asking for all the details on a project. And, you know, I know the position you're in, it's not wanting to look, it's these 99,000 people that have created, I'm sure some of the times the clients that you're working with were once those people on Instagram that were following were. you Absolutely. right and, yeah. and admiring. Yep. So you always have to be cognizant of treating everybody with respect, but the, you know, has to start with the, the person who's paid you first. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I always tell people that this, this business is hard because there is no Bible. There is no handbook that you can pull out and say, okay, now that I'm starting this division of our business, how do I manage this relationship mm -hmm. and how do I handle these questions? And, you know, I mean, we're paving new paths. This is a new, a new way of doing business for interior designers. And yes, I'm not the first and I won't be the last to do this. So, um, and, but unfortunately we've all done it kind of back to back that there's not really a place you can go and say, start here, then you're going to do this. And if someone asks you this question, this is how you respond. Exactly. I mean, it's just, you know, so it's, I always tell our clients, everyone that, this, every project is a new project and every situation is a new situation. So communication is a hundred percent key for the, these type of situations. Mm, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, social media has added a whole nother layer of the beast to everything. There's no question. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> the good, the bad and the ugly of it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no question that there's tremendous advantages. I mean, we wouldn't have this community f around the podcast if it weren't for social media. So there's not yeah. a chance I will ever begrudge it but when right. I think about strictly from the standpoint of having a brick and mortar business it is mm -hmm. you know just the fact that I have to pay somebody a full-time salary to produce content for social yeah. media is insanity yep. it, it is crazy <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, you know, but I guess it's no different than any other, you know, job description in any other point in period of time. I guess one point we all had people that delivered the milk, not me. I'm not that old. I mean, but, yeah. you know, there are people that did have their milk delivered. <laughs> okay. Now we have it delivered again with Amazon, right? <laughs> exactly. Full it's, circle. <laughs> it's so funny. We had the milkman and now we have Amazon. Hi, yeah, yeah. So crazy. So crazy. Well, Bria, you are something else. You really um, have got your head on your shoulders. I'm sure you face challenges every day, just like all of us do. But yep. um, I love the way it really looks as though you think them through and you are willing, as you said, always to learn something else from somebody else and to um, just look at things a different way and how it can be done better. I love. Oh, one thing I didn't ask you, I got to make an assumption, but yeah. do you have a weekly team meeting that's a face-to-face -face meeting? Yes, we do. We have um, our, we call them Monday morning meetings mm -hmm. um, where the entire, everyone in the office meets for about a half hour on Monday mornings to review just kind of a recap of the previous week, what's coming up in the next week, talk about any new processes or policies or anything that might have changed. Um, if I've been traveling or part of our team's been traveling, we always do little mini presentations of what we learned or what we saw. Um, it's just kind of like a little kickstart to the week. Um, and then we actually use the, we do the EOS system um, and we just started implementing it with our leadership team and we're rolling it out to the rest of the team in August. Um, so we do what we call L10 meetings, which are just like high energy, very organized 90-minute um, meetings with our departments um, that is, has a very strict structure to it um, that allows us to crank out a lot of information and a lot of um, detail in that short time. So um, we try to keep our meetings minimal because otherwise you could just, it's just like emails. You could be doing it all day and not really get anything done. Um, but those are definitely critical parts to keeping our team on the same page. Uh, so just tell us a little bit about EOS. I, of course, I've heard yeah. of it before, but I'm sure there's a lot that haven't, and I'm not that knowledgeable and versed on it. Yeah. So EOS is, I think it stands for entrepreneurial operating system. Mm -hmm. Um, it's basically a way to structure your company. Um, it, it gives you guidance in your um, accountability charts, they call it, where you create the seats in your company, the positions of your company, and then you layer in all of the tasks of each seat, and then you add your team members. Um, so that has been really helpful to talking about 
having your employees stay in their own lane. Um, that has been crucial for us when you have this many employees to make sure that everyone knows what they're responsible for and what they're not supposed to be doing. Um, and then it also gives us the structure of um, they setting, they call it rocks. So it's basically projects that you assign to yourselves. Um, normally for an individual, you don't have more than two to three rocks for a quarter and it can be big projects. Like we're getting ready to expand our office space again and that is a rock for one of my leaders on my leadership team to um, get it organized, schedule all the people that need to be here to help us with the expansion, um, where are things going, who's gonna help with it, who's, what is the new space gonna look like. Um, you know, we get these overwhelming internal projects that can kind of get pushed to the back burner because we're so client focused. Mm -hmm. This allows us to really truly tackle projects and feel like you got something done. And I think that's been the biggest game changer for us is, you know, I'm a visionary. So of course I have 8,000 ideas and things that I want to do. It slows me down. Mm -hmm. Um, it allows my team to focus and makes me focus, um, so that we're only picking two or three projects at a time to tackle. And it gives you a sense of accomplishment at the end of it. When you get to check that rock off your list and go to your next quarterly meeting and say, yep, I got that done, you know, and look at where we've come. So um, it's a really, really amazing system. Um, there are some great books. Traction is one of them. Get a Grip is kind of, I recommend if anyone's ever interested in learning about EOS, um, there's a book called Get a Grip that's kind of a parable. It's a story telling about a company that implements EOS into their business. And that was the perfect book for me to start with to kind of get an idea of how exactly EOS works and how it can truly impact the business. That's awesome. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're not even a year in, um, but it has made huge strides in our company and getting the right people in the right seats for our company and making sure, you know, it helps you set up your core values and just really, truly gets everyone on the same page. I love it. My friend Jillian Larray told me about this a couple of months okay. ago. Yeah, she sure. specifically yeah. Um, told me about this system and told me about both of these books as well. And so I, that's why I said to you, I know of it, but I didn't know enough, yeah. well enough to describe it. I just remember right. Jillian saying to me, Luann, you got to do this. <laughs> it, it's kind of life changing as a business owner, I have to say. Um, I mean, and I don't think that it's dedicated to a certain size business, which is great. You can kind of, it scales with you. It is actually a tool. I wish I had started it a couple of years ago when I was trying to scale. Right. Um, it would have been a much more organized process. That's for sure. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my goodness. I love it. Such great information you shared with us today, Bria. Thank you. Thank you. I can't, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. I'm sure we'll meet at High Point, Thanks. right? Yes, I will be in High Point. I am every time. I love it there. <laughs> okay, let's make sure we meet this time, okay? That sounds great. Thank, thank you, you, you so you. much for having me. You're welcome. Hashtag smart lady, wouldn't you say? Hmm. Here are the four things that I want you to take away from Bria's interview. The first is that she has 16 years in the industry. This doesn't happen in a minute. The second is that she's learned a ton from her time at Ethan Allen. So important, those first jobs and what you learn and how you absorb the lessons on the business side of this, okay? Third is that she knows clearly that she is a salesperson first, an interior designer second, all right? And then lastly, she constantly adjusts and tweaks her systems as well as the various positions within her firm as she has grown her firm firm, right? So she, the point is that she's created a foundation for herself as a business owner, yet she stays flexible as she grows and runs her firm. She's not stuck in how she used to do things. She understands as she grows, she might have to change things, even if it's the way she used to do it. All right. Another lesson from Bria is her approach to opening Brook and Lou. Did you notice that when I asked her why did she start this business within a business that she had a very specific detailed reason why she had a clear vision for the brand. She had a clear idea of who the target client is and she understood how this Brook and Lou would fit in 
compliment and not compete with her interior design firm. All right. I also noticed she was smart enough to trademark her brand descriptor, Life Friendly. Very clever, very astute. Okay. Although I'm not one bit surprised after talking to her for an hour. If you are interested in using her Life Friendly products, be sure to set up your trade account today. Go to brookandlou.com. Now that's Brook, B R O O K E A N D. L-O-U.com. Now, speaking of opening a trade account, have you opened your trade account with article.com yet? And have you placed your first order yet? I'd love to know if you are as pleased with their products, customer service, and delivery program as I am. Take a picture of your article.com purchase and tag me and article in the post on social media. To set up your account now and to see all of the classic mid-century furniture and accessories, go to welldesigned.com article.com today. That's welldesigned.article.com. All right, we are days away from High Point Market Fall 2019. If you're listening in real time, if you need more conversation on how to scale your business, how to set up your system so you have a firm foundation, uh, whether you are ready to grow now or you want to be prepared to grow, join me at the High Point Market Theater on Sunday morning, at 9.30 a.m. I will be talking with Laura Umansky of Laura U and Kate O'Hara of Martha O'Hara Interiors. Laura's team is 16, 17 people and Kate, I think, is up around 25. So I'm going to have them break down how they manage their firms, the projects and the lessons and the mistakes they've overcome along the way. All right. This will be followed by a book signing. So if you already have my books, either one of them or both of them, bring them. I'll be happy to sign them for you. If you still have yet to get them, you can buy them right there. And guess what? You can take them, read them home on the plane, right? Bonus, several of my co-authors will be on hand for you to meet and have them sign as well. How fun will it be to meet Nicole Heimer, Peter Lang, Eileen Hahn, Shauna Lynn Simon, and Claire Jefford, right? We're all going to be there. So what will you do today to meet? make your firm better. Will you implement a new tool like Asana or Slack that Bria uses? Will you spend some time planning your vision for your firm in 2020? Will you call a business bestie and set up accountability meetings? Whatever you do, decide to do it well. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.